All right. Brother Sting, start making your way down here because as slow as you walk, I'll have a lot to say before you get here. <laughs> now, you, now, let me say this. What you'll find if you read church history is that during different periods of time in church history, different truths are under attack. Uh, I remember a cycle back in the 80s when the King James Bible was under attack, an all-out attack because of the New American Standard Version and NIV, uh, and we had fights almost over that. King James survived, and uh, it survived for a long, long time. It was the Bible that brought about the Great Awakening, the Bible the Lord used to save my soul. It's good enough for me, and we're going to stick with it. You'll find that, though, that during different periods, I recall in the late 90s, early 2000s, a big attack from some of our brethren that rose up in our midst over church authority. And uh, we're thankful for the brethren who stood for the fact that the Lord works through his churches. You know, uh, I remember battles over the doctrines of grace. It would peak for a period of time. And thankful for our brethren who stood strong on the doctrines of grace. And now we have people rising up even out of our own churches, again, attacking the King James Bible. I'm going to stand with it, brother. And uh, so you come on up here, brother, saying, listen carefully. Uh, and, and I know when I sit through this in Bible college, there's some terms you may not understand, but listen carefully. Maybe it'll pique your interest to study some more. All right, brother, Stain, make sure your microphone's on. Appreciate you. Come on up. This large brown book I just put down here is uh, Samuel Moreland's History of the Valleys, History of the Churches of the Valleys of Piedmont. And if you want to look at that, it's uh, got confessions of faith, statements of faith, 800s on to the 1200s. It's got a lot of woodcuts in there, which was their way of illustration of showing how that the brethren were persecuted, put on spikes crucified, sewn up in bags, thrown in a river. You can look through that, but I don't want that to go. Uh, these other books are my books. Some of them I had to buy at a considerable amount because they've been out of print for a long time. Uh, these were $40 a piece because they've been out of print for a long time. These were 20 But so these and those, and uh, Janice has got a couple on the, uh, very scholarly books on the, the uh, translation. Uh, I would like them signed out. So I and and you know I, I want those back. But if you'd sign your uh, which book you took, if you were interested in taking one, and uh, sign your name to it. Let me ask before we get started: Is there anyone who is good with wood? Uh, who might have time to build a couple of track racks to put in the entrance out there. We have over 20,000 good Baptist tracks with our names on them, printed by Bryan Station Baptist Church. It'd be a shame to let them go to waste. So uh, if anybody would be able to do that, interested in doing that, I'd really appreciate your help in that. If you haven't watched that movie by uh, William Tyndale, God's Outlaw, I hope you would still watch it. But it's not so much to help you understand, but I think it'll make it more real to you. Um, and we can still have that in church sometime. Uh, I think you'll be... Uh, but I would have you to know that movie was made by Protestants. Where there are Anabaptists involved, they are not likely to tell you of that if they can at all avoid it, especially in that era. They would like to act as if Baptists didn't even exist, but there were a lot of Anabaptists there. Uh, 
They would much rather own Tyndale as their own if they can do it like the Catholic Church did with St. Patrick, either nationally or religiously, and the producers are British, so I guess they do own him nationally, I suppose. The tendency of man is to either try to own a man's fame or to discredit him. That's just natural, I suppose. But we're dealing with things that are spiritual, so we need to exercise spiritual discretion and discernment, don't we, knowing what's in man. Even as the Bible says of our Lord, he did not reveal himself unto them at one point, knowing what is in man. As I said last week, William Tyndale's parents' names are still on the rolls of a Baptist church there on the border of Wales. Hezekiah and Llewellyn Tyndale, they were members of the Baptist church at Abergavernavi, South Wales. And that was his upbringing. They certainly would have known that, you would think, you know, as much as they studied his life to prepare that movie. Yet they never mentioned it. Baptists were predominant in parts of England, especially in Wales in those days. Most people got away with it if they stayed out of the attention of the Catholic prelates, you know. I guess I opened up a bit of a turmoil last week with Gail Ripplinger's books. I assure you, I know absolutely nothing about Gail Ripplinger. We ordered them because they are still available, and whatever else may be the case, she certainly does do an excellent job of collating the changes that have been made in these modern versions. I have three of her books and have loaned them to Sister Janice, and she, uh, she liked the one entitled The Language of the King James Version the best. I only have one of those, so I'll make that copy available down there. Anyone who wants to see it, she liked all three. And it's like she said, anyone can look at Ripplinger's charts and open their Bibles, look at whatever version of the chart she's collating in whatever section of her book you're looking at, at whatever new version it is, and see for themselves whether those things be true. You don't even have to buy those versions. You can look online to look them up. It amazes me that people who repeat these rumors about her will not even lift a finger to open one of her books to see if that's so. I understand that Mrs. Ripplinger has answered many of the charges against her in the back of one of her books. Uh, I may have a little bit more to say about this in just a moment, but uh, I was told that uh, G.A. Ripplinger stands for God and Ripplinger, and she's supposed to have some kind of a, she's supposed to believe that she's inspired in some way. You know, that just sounds like a discreditation campaign to me. I don't know. The more I think of it, though, that's her real name, isn't it? I wouldn't even report such a rumor except to show you how silly that sounds. I think if you think about it, I wish they would think about that. They got that on social media. Let me now, uh, as we have come to the end of the first part, I want to read you somewhat of what Cardinal Hosea said. He was president of the Council of Trent during the Reformation, which council they held from 1545 and we're still trying to work out what they would do well over 50 years later because of the Reformation, which was exploding all around them. But at one point, Cardinal Hoseus, trying to calm down the rage against the Reformers, I think, realizing their tactics would have to, would have to change, or maybe even that they should be persecuted all the more. I don't know what he was thinking. But he wrote of the Anabaptist, quote, if you would behold their cheerfulness in suffering persecution, the Anabaptists run before all the other heretics or Protestants. If you have regard to their number, it is likely that they would swarm above all others. If you were not grievously, or if they were not grievously plagued and cut off by the knife of persecution these past thousand years, if you have an eye to the outward appearance of godliness, both Lutherans and Zwingalians must needs grant that they far surpass them in holiness, if you'd only say it. If you will be moved by the boasting of the word of God, 
These be no less bold than Calvin to preach, and their doctrine must stand aloft above all the glory of the world, must stand invincible above all power, because it is not their word, but the word of the living God, end quote. Yet he stayed a Catholic till his dying day and still sought to defeat us by whatever means possible. One of the outcomes of the Council of Trent is that they begin to become more missionary, but still they sent monks with armies. That era was just the beginning of their missionary activities in America. I'm so thankful the Lord saved. My wife and I, out of that. So, as we come down to the time of William Tyndale, let me set the stage. The Byzantine Empire lasted until the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Empire in 1453, okay? There were Anabaptists in many places in Europe. There were even true churches within the Byzantine Empire. When that empire fell, it sent tens upon tens of thousands fleeing into mainland Europe, bringing their Greek Bibles with them. That's all that they spoke in the Byzantine Empire. They had always spoken Greek. It was their native tongue. And they too had copies of the original text, not the Vatican text. They'd never had the Vatican text. So people throughout Europe, throughout Europe began noticing that the Bible that they brought with them agreed perfectly with the Bible that these Anabaptists had all along. They were received and embraced by many of the institutions of higher learning in Europe. And the study of Greek came into vogue among Europe's intelligentsia, Europe's elite. It's been said that two things led to the Protestant Reformation, the fall of the Byzantine Empire and the invention of the printing press. That's commonly said. But there's a third. Don't forget that all along there had been this underlying influence of these Anabaptists. The Reformers themselves confessed that they had been influenced by their preaching throughout the countryside. Luther, Melanchthon, Zwingli. John Calvin himself had been influenced by a young Anabaptist girl, a cousin he had, and likely was converted under those teachings when he attended those services while he stayed at her home. It's where he learned the doctrines of grace from. The printing press itself was invented by Johannes Gutenberg in Germany around 1440 A.D., just before that, but it needed a lot of improvement from then on, and it was more and more perfected in the last half of the 1400s. God bringing all this together at that pinpoint of time, later 1400s, uh, throughout the 1500s. And in the latter 1400s, there was a Catholic priest named Erasmus who never operated as a Catholic priest. He seemed to bore into the idea. He wrote and advocated much about the need of the reformation of the Catholic Church itself, for which, surprisingly, he was not called into account. Because of his language studies and the fact that he became somewhat of a perpetual student at the one university, then another, he became accepted as a prime scholar among the elite, the elite of Europe. He wrote many books, like the Institutio Principis Christiani, or The Education of a, Prince, of a Christian Prince, published in Basel, 1516. It was written as advice to the young King Charles of Spain, later Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. Erasmus applies the general principles of honor and sincerity to the special functions of the prince whom he represents throughout as the servant of the people. Three years later, Niccolo Machiavelli wrote The Prince. There's a comparison between the two that is worth noting. Machiavelli's book was written in answer to the book which Erasmus wrote. Machiavelli stated, quote, to maintain control by political force, it is safer for a prince to be feared than loved. Erasmus preferred for the prince to be loved. Now, that story tells much about Erasmus's character. It appears to me that Erasmus knew he was nowhere near as ruthless as he would have had to have been to have survived in the Catholic clergy. So instead, he kept his head down, operated as a perpetual scholar instead. He wrote many books of note, but evidently, because of the schools he had went to and the people who had sponsored him, he was always considered a part of the clergy and thus unblameable. 
much as Tyndale was operating just a decade later in Europe, in England, I mean, excuse me. It was said that Erasmus wrote and spoke Latin better than any citizen of Rome ever had. But as he learned Greek and became interested in the Greek text of, this, of his day and comparing them, even for the time that he went to England, taught in their universities for some time before going back to Europe, he made his intentions clear to publish a Greek grammar and a Greek Bible. And the Pope gave him permission to do just that. Because he was such a renowned scholar, because of the schools he had gone to, and that he was recommended of many, the Pope gave him his blessing even to the point of allowing him to, see, to have that Gnostic Greek text that had been buried in the Vatican Library, Vaticanus was to be trotted out once again. Probably hadn't seen the light of day since it was put there after Jerome had used it in 380 AD to make his Latin Vulgate. It was that same Vaticanus that was brought out when Sinaiticus was found. Your printouts, I'll speak about them a little bit later, but the, the, the writing part of it tells about that. Sinaiticus found in the latter 1800s. But Erasmus rejected that Gnostic Bible. No, well, he considered it far too inferior to base his work upon it, considered it corrupted. Instead, without telling the Pope, he set himself to gathering every Greek text that he could get his hands on, whether it be the Anabaptist text or the text coming out of Constantinople. After the fall of the Byzantine Empire, he found those to be agreeable to his work and agreeable to each other. It was our Bible that he used to make his Greek text. Don't forget that. He published his first Greek New Testament in 1516. And after further polishing, he came out with it again in 1519. After even more polishing, published his third edition, 1522. This was the one that William Tyndale got his hands on within the first two years of it being in print. Now, there's no question about Tyndale's upbringing. His parents were Anabaptist, and in that region where he grew up on the border of Wales, Anabaptists had held street preaching and worshipped openly at that time. We used to have a tract that was entitled William Tyndale the Baptist. I pondered that question for over 40 years, 44 to be exact, since I saw that tract. You saw in the movie how that Roman Catholicism claimed him as their own. They're even holding some special celebration at one of their Catholic cathedrals in London right now to celebrate his work, though they would still discourage their people from reading his Bible, the King James Version. Could he, like Erasmus, have kept his personal beliefs under himself and operated within the Catholic ranks as a closet Christian, as it were? Could he have rationalized that stance for the greater cause of getting an English Bible into print, which had been his dream from his latter teens? Well, I've come to the conclusion that he did. Brother Johnson believed that he was a true Baptist at heart. We shall all have to wait to see if it was so indeed. If it was Brother Johnson who told me of young Anne Boleyn. She was a virtuous young Anabaptist girl who was forced to marry Henry VIII to keep her family safe. You remember how she was always reading William Tyndale's translation in the movie? At least that was true to life. You know, it was 10 months after Tyndale was burned that Henry finally gave his approval to publish Tyndale's Bible. I truly wonder if it wasn't perhaps pangs of guilt for beheading Anne Boleyn that may have led to his finally approving that publication of the Tyndale Bible. She'd pled for its publication. She was a young, comely lass that he'd married in his old age, or his, he, was, he was above middle age. I think she was the one wife that he probably loved most or missed most. Questionable whether he truly loved anyone but himself. But when he decided he wanted another, it was his Catholic advisors that recommended that she be charged with adultery with her own brother and beheaded so he could get what he wanted. Of course, her brother visited her often 
course he did. He carried news of her back home. Her family was worried for her. I truly believe that both she and that young man will wear a martyr's crown in glory. The beheading of both of them served a very important part in the providential purpose of God in getting that Bible in print in spite of these awful movies that have been made today portraying her as some kind of a terrible woman. Evil forces and Catholic rumors still do all that they can to discredit the truth today and anyone who stands for it. William Tyndale had many wealthy sponsors at a time when many worship services were done in the privacy and safety of one's own home because of the hundreds of years of persecutions that had gone on. Who were they persecuting all that time before the Reformation even took place? Who else was there but Baptist? And there were many wealthy Baptists in many parts of England, and many lost all that they had when they were discovered. But many homes held closet services to train their children as they truly believed. I suspect that his sponsors appreciated what Tyndale believed. They appreciated it to the extent of wanting to talk to their children. How many of those old mansions had chapels within the home? Later, when the Catholics fell out of favor, they used them in the exact same way. It went with being English. But that one owner of an estate, if you remember the movie, who was second to King Henry VIII at court, held that position only because King Henry liked the way he set a horse. So I suspect that he had hired William to teach their children because they believed as William believed and were able to protect him, though they worried for him constantly. We know that. He had been sponsored earlier by one who paid his way all the way through Oxford and on until he mastered at least seven different languages fluently. And once he had degrees, his, child, his childhood background, background would have never been pursued. And later in Europe, he was helped by many others, among whom were many Anabaptists. Well, it did get to the point where he was earnestly sought out with the charge of heresy and did suffer being burned at the stake at 42 years of age. But I don't believe that he ever forgot his upbringing. Crane up a child and the way he shall go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. You remember his best friend from school in the movie? John Firth had been his childhood friend. He'd no doubt have known the Baptist himself. They went to school together. They were complicit in everything. He has been said to have probably been the greatest theologian in Europe at the time, in all of Europe. I suspect that he was a Baptist as well. What does that book make? It makes Baptists, doesn't it? Remember, he was burned before Tyndale was. But as with Erasmus, once Tyndale's scholarship had become renowned, nothing of his origins would have ever been brought up again. That would have been as far as anyone would have ever looked. No one would have believed that an Anabaptist could have ever got such an education or come to such scholarship. And why did he flee to the mainland Europe to hide there to finish his work? Listen, by that time, most of the languages on the continent already had the Textus Receptus text. They already had their own languages, their own Bibles in their own languages from the Textus Receptus text, and had so for a couple of decades already. It was a much more liberal atmosphere. Nobody talks about that. Well, the main scholar that helped produce that movie, in a documentary he makes, it's about an hour long, you can also find it on YouTube, he tells that. He tells us that. But it was much more lenient atmosphere for the most part. Yet what was happening in England was yet the continuing violent reaction to John Wycliffe's English translation over 100 years earlier. But Wycliffe and his Lollard followers had made handwritten translations of the Latin Vulgate into English. He did not use the Textus Receptus. Yet the Catholics at the time, when the Catholic Church still held absolute sway, reaction to that translation was still being felt in England. Uh, they were uh, burned... People were still being burned for having just a verse of, the, of that translation on their person. Uh, laws had been made, strict laws, as to, uh, well, as to both uh, 
Wycliffe and his translation, anybody who had it. People were still being burned at the stake now, 100 years later. But the way they treated someone who was considered a scholar in that day was altogether different. Tyndale would have been given the benefit of the shadow of the doubt that no one else would have been given. Most people wouldn't even have known that a, what a Greek text, a Greek New Testament even looked like. And Anabaptists were still passing out portions of the scriptures in English that had been translated from the Bibles that they'd had and passed down from the very first centuries. How complete those Bibles were, I don't know. But Tyndale was the first to publish a whole New Testament in English from the TR text. It really did take the work of both Erasmus and Tyndale to get the job done. And once done, it was done. Tyndale managed to translate the entire New Testament in the Pentateuch in the second quarter of the Old Testament, Joshua through Chronicles in the book of Jonah into English. New Testament was his first complete New Testament. The remainder of his work was left to those who were under the spell of his genius over the next 80-some years. Once Henry VIII had gave his permission to publish it, Baptists had brought those ideas, those texts, down to this time to the extent that the King James Version has often been called a Baptist book. And I wholly embrace that distinction. We have ever been the people of the book. It was Baptist who kept and handed down the TR text throughout the dark age. It was Baptists that willingly offered their lives and their blood to preserve that book for future generations. Those handouts that I gave you show the many editions that followed. It was finished and polished as it went through all these editions. On the back, looking at the left side chart at the bottom, and one of these first names was a made-up name. They were told, the publisher, to hide the fact that it was Tyndale's work because they had so recently martyred him. But the publisher of that edition put a leaf just between the Old Testament and New with the bold block initials, WT, and people still knew it was William Tyndale's Bible. Tyndale's Bible went through many revisions the next 80 years as the rest of the Bible was added. Looking at the names of them there, the Coverdale Bible, the Matthew Bible, 1537, the Great Bible, 1539, the Geneva, 1560, the Bishop's Bible, 1568, just polishing the Tyndale Bible. The English language went through vast and many changes those 80-some years. Perhaps the most transient time in the English language ever. It was changing so rapidly. So they revised Tyndale's Bible as the language changes. They brought the language up to date, even as they have done many times since. They bring the language up to date, but they don't tamper with the translation. Listen, these modern Bibles are often called revised Bibles, the Revised Standard Version, for example, but they're not revised Bibles. They're whole new translations from corrupted texts. They're playing word games with you. It has gone through many revisions. They bring the language up to date as the language changes without tampering with the translation. The New King James Version says that that's all that they've done, but they're lying to you. I can show you places where they completely reversed the meaning. Just look at Kipling, Ripplinger's books and see but when you get to the King James Version in 1611, it was said that the idiom that was used was still 99% Tyndale's idiom. They copied it, mimicked his idiom. It was considered so good. Some quibble and say, oh, it wasn't that high. You know, maybe it was 97%. You know, if they all rate it very high in the high 90s, I'm sticking with 99. <laughs> and that as to what they had, it was really like they had laid down Tyndale's Bible side by side, followed it as a guide almost all the way through the translation process of the King James Version. It's a Baptist Bible. They followed his idiom and his methods, entranced by his genius. As to the 47-some translators that were given that opportunity to set it in stone, as it were, just know that that kind of scholarship today could never be assembled. The climate could never be repeated. It was God's perfect time and done fully at his bidding. After 80 years of the influence of the Word of God, the King James Version was the first English Bible to draw directly from the Hebrew and Greek text. The first English translation to take advantage of the printing press and was said to be the very first to directly challenge the power of the Roman Catholic hierarchy on the world stage as a challenge of a whole nation. Now, don't believe... 
all the ugly rumors put out by the Catholics about King James either that were launched to discredit the King James Version. Most of them are untrue, especially as to be his being a homosexual. That's untrue. Even as the rumors about Anne Boleyn, as we've already seen, they were untrue. So now let me give you an example of the change of the language. And this is a Baptist history course, and it's also uh, on the text. But let me give you an example of the change of the language from the early 1500s, 1611. In the latter 1400s and early 1500s, when Tyndale lived, the word Puritan was applied to the English Anabaptist, as it was they who believed in a regenerate church membership. As we saw last week, we were often spoken of as the pure ones or Puritans. The word Cathari means the exact same thing, I think, in the French. Uh, we were the Puritans. For just that reason, but a hundred years later, early 1600s, that word was applied to those in the Church of England who wanted to purify the Church of England, and they hated the Baptists. When those Puritans came to America in the early 1600s, they too believed in a regenerate church membership as a result of Baptist influence, but within a generation or two, they came up with a halfway covenant. Within wherein those children born to the Puritans in America were said to be halfway into the church and would be fully brought into the church at the time of their conversion. But there were less and less conversions under that kind of atmosphere. By the time of the Salem witch trials, when more than 200 people were charged with witchcraft in 1693, less than 100 years later, uh, about 80 years later, it was a totally unregenerate church ruled solely by superstition. Most people don't know that history. It was in that climate that the Salem witch trials took place. Seriously, they had to change their name to the Congregationalist to try to live that one down. And that is significant because it was first one Puritan named Henry Dexter who made the charge that the Baptists started in 1641 with the South Baptism of Roger Williams, whom the Baptists never claimed. He's called a Sea Baptist, S-E-Baptist. That means a self-baptizer. But he didn't have any authority to baptize himself, being unordained. And who baptizes themselves, really? The authorities in the church, and he didn't seek out a true church to baptize him either. Though one was near present, John Clark's First Baptist Church was near present at Newport, Rhode Island. J.R. Graves' book, that Brother Lowell is getting tells that story, the First Baptist Church in America by J.R. Graves. So later, Mr. Dexter, the Puritan, admitted that he could not write concerning the Baptist without dipping his pen in the juice of gall. He, came, he first came up with a theory that the Baptist began in 1641. He called it his discovery. No doubt he knew better, but he started that story. Then later, in 1873, one professor, Norman Fox of William Jewell College, repeated that theory as his, new, as his new 1641 discovery and was castigated by Baptists at large at that time. But then towards the very end of the 1800s, the president of Old Southern in Louisville, one Dr. William Whitsett, who had served in the Southern Calvary under General Nathan Bedford Forrest, and as he was this jovial old man who was loved by all and congenially called Uncle Billy by all, he started what became known as the Whitsett Controversy at the end of the 1800s. By the custom of the time, among families that could, who would have thought to get a more polished education for their children, they would send their children to one of the European universities. So Whitsett went to the Tübingen University in Germany after the war, Civil War. It was the most liberal and humanistic school of the day. Their school of theology was anything but Christian. Thus enters both German higher criticism and Darwinism and Westcott and Hort, which were all the bane of C.H. Spurgeon. Spurgeon called it the downgrade controversy in his old age. Even Brother Ken Johnson oft lamented of the damage done up by the Tubingen Seminary. This was an attack on every hand of all that Spurgeon believed. Whitsitt had jumped smack dab into the cauldron of it all. After coming back to America and having somehow been appointed president of Old Southern in Louisville, 
somehow he was enticed to publish what he called his new 1641 discovery. And lo and behold, he first published it anonymously in the most anti-Baptist paper of the day, the Congregationalist paper. Note that, those old Puritans again, that old Puritan hatred, the New York Independent. So here's that, Congregationalist hatred. But when it was found out that he had published it, when his name was finally attached to it, and he claimed it as his discovery, that being that Baptists first began with the C. Baptist, Roger Williams, whom none of us claimed. They each and all called it the very own discovery. Well, it started what became known as the Whitsitt Controversy, and it was hard for many to see him in another light once he set forth his 1641 theory, which was the same 1641 theory put forth twice before, but now with a Baptist promoter who had so much influence within their ranks, publishing it in a Congregationalist newspaper. It might would have tore the convention apart, except that many were prone to overlook it. Many just didn't know what was going on. Others just didn't want to know. Couldn't be true of old Uncle Billy. But here was this man drawing $4,500 a year salary from the largest Southern Baptist school at that time while sneaking around trying to destroy all that Baptists believed. The Witsit controversy created such a stir of do-nothingness in the convention that within one or two generations, most of their schools had retreated to a universal invisible church position. It caused a split off and founding of the Arkansas Baptist State Association in 1902. A nationwide association of landmark missionary Baptists was formed in 1905. And in 1924, the Baptist Missionary Association of Texas joined this association and the name was changed to the American Baptist Association. The ABA and the Bogart Press was the extension of that. The reaction to what was going on in the convention. And then later in 1950, the Bible Baptist Fellowship was formed. They all came out of this destruction of the Southern Baptist Convention as well. And there's not a one of the Southern Baptist churches teaching Baptist history today. Though their school, Old Southern in Louisville, has the most extensive section on Baptist history that exists at this hour. They don't teach on it or send any of their students to do research in it. They don't refer to it at all. When Brother Gum used to go do research there, he was always amazed that such a huge section of the library was always deserted, lights out, with nary a student there. He'd have to get them to turn the lights on for him. And that was 40, 50 years ago. I don't believe that a Southern Baptist preacher could be found today who really understands and believes church truth. Every student they've graduated for over 70, 80 years has been taught that Protestant theory of a universal invisible church which can nowhere be found in the Bible. And unless he was a closet landmark Baptist before ever going to one of their schools, he wasn't going to be taught anything but Protestant church theory there. Now that whole Witsit controversy is documented in detail in a book by D.B. Ray, who lived through all that in just the first 90 pages of his 300-page book, Baptist Succession, a handbook of Baptist history. I've got three copies. I have four. My son's got one right now. He details it in full. And as I said at the beginning here tonight, or maybe it was last week, a uh, very important book. Brother Lowell is ordering that book by J.R. Graves, First Baptist Church in America. Also details, deals with this, these false charges, the exact same issue. Both D.B. Ray, J.R. Graves, both contemporary with William Whitsett, knew the whole story well. But today, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. All these things are being forgotten. I've got uh, two and a half pages I was going to add to this. Uh, there's one of these young men who is very dear to me. I'll see what I can get of this. I don't want to go through all of it. Who has been very led astray by Protestant theology that he had become greatly disturbed when he found out that the Philadelphia Association and Confession, that it was universal church. And even I was surprised when I looked at it at first in its present form. He's correct. But checking with some of our churches and asking Brother Collins here, these churches, our churches, actually lean to the New Hampshire Confession for the very same reason, but brethren, no church was ever started by an association. 
That is an error of thinking to base what one believes on irrelevant evidence. Churches start churches. These churches, our churches, come from missionaries from New England churches who came down into Virginia after the Great Awakening when so many of great George Whitfield's converts got into their Bibles and ended up submitting to Baptist baptism and flooding into Baptist churches that Mr. Whitfield exclaimed, all of my chickens have become ducks. And brother, all those saved pioneer families made the American Revolution possible. Thomas Jefferson's biographer called them the stormtroopers of the revolution. They'd never fought for themselves nor their own freedom, but here when they saw an opportunity to gain religious freedom for all, they threw themselves full force into the cause. When the question of the loyalty of so many was affected by their religious affiliation and members of the Church of England and Puritans and Catholics filled the Tory ranks, these Baptists could be counted on. George Washington's personal chaplain was the Baptist preacher, John Gano. And according to his account, he baptized George Washington in the river at Valley Forge. Uh, uh, Georgetown College up here was started by John Gano. John Gano Boulevard. Gano Hall. I don't think anybody there knows who he was anymore. That school doesn't teach the Bible anymore. It was, a, it was originally a Baptist school. See, what happens is because they leave church truth or any truth, they leave the, the, the teachings of the Word of God, well, except the Lord build the house, right? Uh, Washington used them as couriers, spies, personal confidence. They filled the ranks of his army much as Oliver Cromwell had in England in the Glorious Revolution. But Cromwell and his Presbyterians turned and persecuted them once he'd gotten in power. Brother, there would have, been, there would have never been the American Revolution without the Baptist. Many a book has been written on their contributions. There's a little yellow one right here that uh, Bryan Station publishes. They've got stacks of They'd be glad to get you one. It's a good book. It tells a lot about this. I know. I wrote it. <laughs> and there's the history of the traveling church in there. When Lewis Craig and three Baptist preachers were in a jail in Spotsylvania, Virginia, preaching out of the jailhouse, and it was said more people were converted to Baptist views in those few days than in all the years that had preceded for so long. And uh, <laughs> who was the great American orator? Uh, no. Uh, I don't have that written, and my brain don't work that fast. Anybody here know? Give me liberty or give me death. Patrick who? Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry. Heard of their plight there. 70 miles down. And here is the speech he gave when he walked into that courthouse that day. And the people, the judge and everybody, when Patrick Henry was done, release those men! <laughs> now I lost my place. The very statute for religious liberty in America was the founding father's gift to the Baptists for their contribution. Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, James Madison lobbied, labored long and hard to achieve this and give it to them. And every other kind of church there was at that time fought tooth and nail against the dis dis disestablishment of religion in America. They still wanted what they considered their right to government monetary support from the taxpayers. And oh, what stories I could tell you about the prior, prior abuse of the Baptist here as they'd been forced to pay taxes and their property confiscated by the Church of England or whatever church was in the power of whatever colony they were in before that. Lands confiscated, thrown in jail for preaching without a license. Did you know we were still called Anabaptist up until just before the American Revolution, even here in America? 
I think it was New Hampshire that still refused to recognize the disestablishment of religion until well into the 1800s. But to get back, brethren, the Philadelphia Association, which my brother is so concerned about, became the Northern Baptist Convention in effect. And they were the very first to turn Protestant, weren't they? 50 years before the Southern Baptist did. Uh, by what I told you about the collapse of the Southern Baptist Convention a half a century later in the breakoff of the ABA and the BBF, it should be evident to you, especially among... Uh, uh, we who are independent landmark Baptists throughout the South, just why it was that Baptists throughout this region, West Virginia, Tennessee, Mississippi, all the way to Texas, Louisiana, etc., the Bible Belt, as it were, why they have remained true to their origins the longest. Throughout the first half of the 1900s, many a staunch, sovereign grace missionary landmark Baptist pastors and papers have stood firmly in the way Books by J.R. Graves, men like J.R. Graves and D.B. Ray and many more. So many now out of print. There's a Bible illustration about that, isn't there? Standing in the way. God told us to stand firm for the faith once delivered to the saints. The Bible Baptist Fellowship who broke in 1950 stayed in too long and they were the first to also go universal church by the 1970s, I'm afraid. Well, I could tell you stories about how they took and plagiarized our books. Roy Mason's book was one, The Church That Jesus Built. Boy, that was a good book. It's still a good book. Great book. I know a Bible Baptist Fellowship pastor out in Denver took that book, plagiarized it. That whole book put his name on it as his own. And on the very last page, threw it all out the window by going to Universal Church at the very end, on the very last page. The one page that was his, I think. But in closing, and it'll take me a little while to close, I have just two missionaries for you to consider. And as I look at these, I see just how far short I have fallen. These whom I believe were doing missions the exact same way they did missions back in the first 400 years of our church history. Exact same pattern. One is William Carey, a Baptist, who translated the Bible into Bengali in India. By the time of his death in 1834, William Carey had translated the complete Bible into six different languages and portions of it into 29 other languages and had founded more than 100 rural schools for boys and girls and had begun a college in Serampore that later achieved university standards status. Who knows how many schools in America a Baptist have founded? And in this, and in his day, there were no phones, no cars, no airplanes, no electricity of any kind. By and large, with the exception of the printing press, civilization was at about the exact same state in India and Burma as it had been in the first four centuries. The second is Adonijah Judson. 1788 to 1850, who translated, get his book to the Golden Shores, the book that was written about him, who translated the Bible into Burmese as he ministered in Burma. And that Bible is still being used to save souls. All their Bibles are. Judson's Bible has reached all the way up into Northeast India. If you look at India, that big section of land that goes way off to the right, it's deceptive looking on a map. It's a huge geographical area. Stretches out over Burma. Judson's Bible went up there, and there's still Baptist churches throughout that whole region. That large section of land there. The fruit of his labors. And I have no doubt that when all shall be known, we shall see that that has been the way it has been done throughout the whole age that while Catholic prelates compass land and sea to make souls twofold more of the children of hell than themselves while they, did, while they did their ghastly work, Anabaptists were eagerly seeking to set souls free. Throughout the age, you see Baptists translating and propagating the word, which they had received from the hands of the apostles themselves, as they so oft said. That's why it's a Baptist book. It's not a Catholic book. 
God said that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. For emphasis, he repeats that in three different gospels. Just a few scriptures now. Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119, 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Matthew 5, 18, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Church perpetuity goes together with the doctrine of the preservation of the scriptures. Same people were used for the most part. 1 Peter 1, 25, but the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Psalm 33, 11, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. That's an emphasis, brother. Psalm 100 and verse 5, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. If the Catholic Vulgate was the Word of God, the world did not even have the Word of God for over 1,100 years. Think of that. As long as it was locked up in its Latin cabinet and hid away from the world. But the history of the Baptist and the preservation of the Word of God go together. And as far as I know, this is the first time that it has ever been taught together. So I hope you appreciate the fact that I had to leave a whole lot out. I hope you understand how abbreviated this has been, but even more, I would ask us all to ask ourselves... Do we love the Word of God that much? Would you have set your whole wife aside to travel all the way to China and learn their language, translate the Bible, and spend your life there as Hudson Taylor did? We could just talk about him too. But, uh, he was in China, 1851, 1905. Went there at 20 years old, all on his own, very little prospects of support. You can watch a 10 lesson series on him taken directly from his own journals on YouTube as well. Hudson Taylor. Would you have copied very various passages of scripture, pass out to others knowing you could be martyred if you were caught with them? Our forefathers did all of this and more. I just hope we appreciate our heritage. It's the greatest heritage any people have ever had. And in Revelation 3.10 he says because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the church. Everybody, I think it's got any sense, knows that's addressed to a church. There in the midst 2,000 years of his patience, he says to the church of Philadelphia that they have kept his word. That verse has to do with the preservation of the word of God as well as the observation of it. History, preservation, word of God, Baptist history. I find that they who reject the one usually reject the other. Ripplinger's not the issue. Corrupted Gnostic texts are the issue. Baptist churches in faith and practice in every century is the issue. Even before 1641. No, we don't believe we can or even need to trace our origin all the way back to our Lord. We simply take our Lord Jesus Christ at his word. He promised us to be with us, with his churches to the end of the age. Did he not? How simple it is to simply trust, thus saith the Lord. What assurance is that? There's one young soul amongst these men who is very dear to me. Even that one who made that comment is dearer than he might suppose. Especially, I'm sure, to those of you who know him best. I was saving one of Ripplinger's books for him, but I don't know what to do now. But there are many other books that I would have preferred to recommend, but I was afraid most of them were no doubt out of print. The most scholarly refutation of Westcott and Hort that has probably ever been written was written by a man who has been called... The unanswered dean, John William Burgeon, who was a contemporary of Westcott Hort in the 1880s and no doubt the greatest language scholar of the day, he wrote a couple of very thorough and lengthy books that soundly refuted their modern textual criticism. 
when it was still in the womb, as it were, but because of the downgrade controversy of the time when the world was carried away with Darwinism and this new so-called science of textual criticism was seen as a way to completely overthrow the Word of God. John William Brujan's books went completely unanswered. They'd been out of print so long, and then in the 1990s, Brother Ken Johnson heard of a special publication where they were photocopying the old books and making 800 copies available. Uh, no doubt would disappear overnight. Brother Ken asked me if I wanted one. I jumped at the chance. And I have since loaned it out and have never seen it again. I don't even remember who I loaned it to. But I just found out that his three books are newly available online again. The Revision Revised in paperback for, for $44.95. Ebook, $57.85. And the traditional text of the Holy Gospels, Twenty-six seventeen, and lastly, inspiration interpretation paper thirty-six twenty-six. Dean John William Berjon. If anybody wants that, and if you'll pardon me, I'd like to recommend four other books. Two of them are down here. Two of them, Sister Powers, will bring back, and she's had them and has been enjoying them. That if you can get them, any way you can get them, the best of these, more recent ones. I mean, the last fifty years or so is a guide to textual criticism by Edward Miller. The second one is Believing Bible Study by Edward F. Hills. Now, I don't know where I don't know which one of these men. It's been so long. Uh, I, I, we'd have to look through them. But one of them worked on one of these high ivory tower modern textual criticism committees and held a high position in one of these universities that was involved in that. And he had to make a complete break with them. He came out, wrote his book, completely refuted their methods and their madness. I have one copy of each of these. Sister Janice Powers has looked through them, I believe, most of them. Then there's Byzantine text types. I think it's down here. And lastly, by Harry Sturtz. And lastly, Inspiration, Canonicity of the Bible by R. Laird Harris. And as I say, I have each one, one of each of these, and we'd have to work. I'd like them signed out if anybody wants to take them. I remember Ken, Brother Ken telling us one time about one of these men who was working on the major textual uh, criticism committee of that time. I think it was called the Nestle Allen Committee. They came up with the Nestle Allen text. And this man, you know, they were, they were supposed to answer all the questions. The biggest thing come along. And... Uh, this man was telling a story out of class, as it were. Brother Johnson had it in print. It was one of the professional journals that Brother Ken subscribed to. And they were rating each passage that they were dealing with in a five-tiered scale as to how authentic that they thought it was. And this man was lamenting that his colleagues seemed to be able to change their opinion about as often and as easily as a man might change his position at his desk. That's the way he put it. Will you trust men or God? Amen. With a little thought as he might shift himself in his chair. This one who was very dear to me told me that he believed that God has preserved his word as well. And in the very next sentence he said, you know, it's only 3% of the Bible that is in question. A few decades ago they were saying that the Bible contains the word of God. Well, which part is it? Someone in the Baptist press wrote that Baptists never believed that they had the actual Word of God, but that it, they just believed that they had a tr translation of it. A reasonable facsimile is the way that they put it. And Brother Ken shut him down by writing and quoting all the times that our forefathers had said, what a blessing it is to hold the very Word of God in our own hands and in our own language. Or even a pagan philosopher like Pythagoras knew that things equal to the same things are equal to each other. If it's a faithful translation from a preserved text, if it's the Word of God in the Greek, it's the Word of God in the English. The Apostle Paul quoted a time from the Septuagint or said in Greek what he'd read in Hebrew and you never hear him apologizing for it, saying, I'm sorry, this is just a translation. Has anybody ever seen that? I don't remember that. And listen, once God got his word into the modern English, why in the world would he want to confuse the issue? It's his issue. No, God is not the author of confusion. The Bible says it's the devil doing that. 
I'm sorry I'm taking a little longer, but I'm just about done. If I can remember where I'm at. <laughs> Brethren, we don't believe what Peter Ruckman believed either. He believed in double inspiration. God done away with the Greek altogether, and he'd re-inspired King James translators to rewrite the whole Word of God again. Well, that too would have left over a thousand years when the world would have been without the Word of God, wouldn't it? And what, would the English-speaking people of the world be the only people on earth to have it? Truth is that the Bible teaching is that it is another one of those twin doctrines that we see so often in the Word of God. It's inspiration and preservation. Not double inspiration. Inspiration and preservation go together. The one is worthless without the other. So what God inspired his word? If you didn't preserve it, you don't have it. Listen, it was Shakespeare's English. It was there. It was where he learned his English from. It solidified or acted as a preservative of the English language as well. It stopped the rapid change in the language that was going. It's more expressive than modern English. The these and the thous that so many people complain about. If he said thee or thou, he's talking to one person. Thee is the more intimate form as to one he loves. If he said ye, you know he's talking to the whole crowd. In modern English, all you got's you. Our language, as all languages, is following the law of entropy, beloved. It's breaking down. It's becoming less expressive as time goes by. We've lost so much since the King James Bible was made. If you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in the Old Testament, you know it's a translation of Jeho the word Jehovah. I don't, I know you know all that, but why in the world would anybody want to throw all that away with a, uh, with a corrupted modern translation? Many people say it's hard to understand. Well, that's a spiritual problem. It must be spiritually discerned. You must be born again to really understand the Word of God. The new birth opens it up and you can really just begin to feed on it. It's the Bible God blessed and used in the great awakening and generation after generation of revivals for the last 400 years been tested at a fourth grade reading level. Isn't that what it was? I believe that's what they said. If I remember right, it's not what's in the Bible that I don't understand that I have a problem with. It's what I do understand I got a problem with. God help us just believe and do what it says. Amen. Before this last century and the age of modern textual criticism, every Bible in the world in whatsoever language it was in was translated from the Textus Receptus family of text, except Catholic Bibles. They have 1,900, 1,900 different manuscripts collected in the TR family that they study, and there's not a single point of doctrinal difference between them. Sinaiticus and Vaticanus Vatican, have nothing but doctrinal difference. So I ask you, did God indeed succeed in preserving his word to every generation or not? The whole of modern textual criticism can be characterized by one verse, Genesis 3.21, and you can see the spirit that's behind it in this as well. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said? Really? Every time you see a note in the margin of some Bible that was published under the critic's instruction that says these versions are not in the most ancient and reliable text, that's that serpent. Hath the Lord said? And this thing today has been done in the most subtle way I can imagine. And that serpent was, serpent was more subtle. If you got a King James Version, keep the King James Version. Ignore the notes. I got Schofield. I like Schofield. I don't, I don't believe a bit about what they say about these verses, not in the most ancient and reliable text. Those notes were first put there over 100 years ago under the influence of West Cotton Hort. They've been proven to be neither the most ancient nor the most reliable, but devil still whispering those ears in the ears of his readers. Ignore them. We believe that Christ was very careful as to use the exact word that he chose to describe his church, the word ecclesia, that can only mean a local, visible assembly, that can only really be churches when they're assembled. The Greeks only ever used that word in the abstract in the sense, since when they referred to an assembly, it was understood when it was assembled. I don't know how else to say it. I make no apology. I believe the Lord chiefly used his particular assembly or, or church people to keep his word, to pass it on. And I believe that one day soon it will be very clear indeed 
to everybody. God has a particular people. He has a particular church. It is no more unrighteous of him to make a difference in who he makes members of his family than it is for who he leads to become members of his kind of churches. Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. If you learned anything from the first few chapters of Genesis, you should have learned that like begets like, everything living reproduces after its own kind, and something dead cannot give birth to something living. Baptist churches produce Baptist churches. That's where they come from. That principle applies to everything God ever made. It is in God's keeping and power that when persecution fell upon his churches, they dispersed, I think, oft, even with the full understanding amongst them, that when they found safe haven again, even from the pages of history itself, together as we so oft see them moving en masse with the understanding that they would settle as still full-functioning churches when they got wheresoever they would, or however many that made it. And we saw that with the Paulicians last week and the Donatists into northern Italy. We see it again in the churches that came over from Wales into this country and other times agreeing amongst themselves to start churches wherever they could, wherever their migration settled them. Would a man question God as to what authority he would recognize? It's his authority. Don't you think that peculiar times required peculiar measures? And that's all in the keeping of God himself. But brethren, in times like these, when it is so easy to do all things decently and in order, as the Bible says, we'd be fools to do otherwise in the sight of God. And may we with not but a clear conscience proceed and let others do as they may. Did you know in our area alone, with about 200 Southern Baptist churches registered with the convention, over 40 of them have removed the name Baptist entirely from their names. But, beloved, it's a fit name with distinction. I'm proud of our forefathers, not of us or them, but of what God has done with them. May we, ever, may we be ever faithful to its heritage and bear forward its banner to others that they too may embrace its distinctions and not with any doubtful disputations, as the Bible says. My goodness, I don't even know what these men are saying. I can't understand them. It's like they're speaking another language or something from from all the Reformed theology that they've been reading. It's confusing. But let us with all confidence and all simplicity speak forth the word of truth that we may be able to face God not having to hang our heads in shame and may God make it all possible is my prayer. And why should it be otherwise? I'm thankful for our heritage. God gave it to us. Listen, God's people believe God's word. That's the mark of them. That's the evidence. Baptists never believed in sacramental salvation. They never believed in transubstantiation where the Catholic priests teach that somehow they magically actually turn the bread and the wine into the real body and blood of our Lord. We read in our Bibles that God made man and nowhere do we see where man ever made God. Jesus taught that those things were mere, mere emblems of his sacrifice that we could Ever be mindful of what he has done for us. These things do in remembrance of me, he said. But salvation has never been something that could be dispensed by the hands of men. Only a new heart will do. Only when a man will turn and cast himself upon the Lord, pleading the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for his sins, will he ever find that Christ shed his own precious blood for him. He'll never find that assurance otherwise. He'll never know that peace. But Christ has said he will accept everyone who will. Amen. You know, it's, it's utterly odd to the natural man that the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ would be called the gospel, the good news. And it'll never be good news to him uh, until he sees himself totally undone and headed to hell. Brother, it, becomes good, it became good news to us, didn't it? Come and receive him. Look and live, the Bible says. Christ receiveth sinful men. Men who have no conscience of sin will see no need of him. But all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Brother Joe.